I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed. Welcome back to Bible Talks Radio. I'm Chris Kramer with the Northside Church of Christ here in Russellville, Kentucky. We invite you to worship with us every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. Just uh, come down to Russellville and look for us at 689 North Main Street. That's where our building is. If you're familiar with Russellville, then you probably know where Kentucky Fried Chicken is, and we're right next door. So we hope to see you. Bring your Bibles, bring your children. We'd love to study God's Word with you when we have classes for all ages. Uh, so come and be ready to study God's Word. Well, it's a treat to have Brother Nick back with us. So uh, He has been in the process of a move with his family for the past couple of weeks. Same town over in Morgantown, but a different house, so a little bit of a different background. Nick, how are you today, and uh, uh, how's your week's been going? (laughs) Well, it's good to be back with you, Chris, and it's been chaos. And uh, you can see my my office is bare bones right now, and you probably hear this little echo. I hope to fix that here before too long, but I wanted to get back on with you and get back to our uh, going through the Bible series. And so just wanted to set up as quick as I could to talk with you, but uh, we're enjoying the new home uh, and, and we hope to uh, honor the honor God through it and serve the kingdom in some way with it. And, and, uh, and so far, you know, we, we're excited to see where things can go with this new place and, and uh, planting some roots here, I guess, uh, in Morgantown, planning, planning to stay for the long haul. So if anybody is interested in coming on out uh, to Christian Home Church of Christ, uh, I welcome anybody to come on out. We meet at 3628 Lovely Road. That is Highway 411, just outside of uh, Morgantown, going down 70 uh, towards Brownsville. And, and so we're about three and a half miles off 70. And 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock is our times of uh, gathering on Sunday. We'll have a Bible class and an hour of worship. Midweek Bible study is Wednesday at 7. And if you want to get in touch with me directly, my telephone number is 270-999-2600. Okay. And if you'd like to comment on this program or have any other Bible questions, you can also email us, northsidechurchofchrist at hotmail.com. Or as uh, we're all over the internet, you can look up our website and just look up Northside Church of Christ, Russellville, Kentucky. You'll find our website with links to our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and uh, and, uh, many ways that you can contact us through that. And even though we come to you every week here on uh, WRUS Radio, uh, you can also find a video version of this program on our YouTube channel as well. So let's go ahead and get into our study. We've taken a break the past couple of weeks from uh, the our book review, you might say, of the various books of the Bible. So we're going to get back to it today. As we have talked about First and Second Kings, we incorporated a little bit of discussion of First and Second Chronicles, which uh, mirrors First and Second Kings quite a bit, though there is maybe a little more information about a few of the accounts and stories that we read. And uh, hopefully you're, you're studying those things on your own. So we don't want to be too repetitive in the, the nature of it. First and Second Chronicles pretty much has the same uh, purpose as, as First and Second Kings. And um, so I've been excited to get into the years of the prophets. As we look at our last study in this subject, when we talked about Second Kings, we see uh, Nebuchadnezzar coming in, the, you know, the destruction of Jerusalem and so on and uh, taking the people into bondage in in Babylon. Uh, They've already been in bondage uh, as far as Israel's concerned, the northern kingdom, uh, for what, about 100 years, I suppose, uh, uh, to the Assyrian. Yeah, they went into uh, Syrian captivity in about 721 BC, and the time we find ourselves with the start of the Babylonian captivity is about 608 BC, but then the temple's destroyed in about 586 BC. Yeah, and so... It, it, that captivity kind of came through in, in, in waves uh, throughout history. And then you've got um, a lot of that focus within that time period has been on, on Nebuchadnezzar and uh, some very interesting accounts. But when we get into the books and the sections of the Bible that deal with uh, you know, the, the aftermath, it, it goes right from, you know, first and second Kings, first and Chronicles to Ezra and to Nehemiah. That's pretty much at the end of the 70-year exile uh, that the Lord uh, uh, 
you know, had brought upon them. And uh, of course, he had promised that in that generation that they would return. So, but in the process of the time period of, of first and second Kings, you also have many other prophets that wrote about the coming uh, of the bondage. Uh, you've got uh, you know, Joel, and Micah, Isaiah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Jeremiah. I'm, I'm saying all these, and you may notice they're a little bit out of order. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain necessarily why these some of these prophets aren't written in a chronological order, uh, but they're there for a purpose, and in this way, as we've compiled them over many years. And Ezra and Nehemiah are, are a good follow-up to you know, first and second Kings. If you wanted to read through, you know, first and second Kings and the Chronicles, and then interject some of the prophets throughout those studies, you can do it in a chronological way. Uh, you can look up charts online. You can find chronological Bibles that'll take you to the stories of fact. And looking at Ezra, uh, pretty much in the middle of Ezra, you also have the account of Esther uh, that takes place right in that time period. And uh, but yet we're going to address that in a future study. And so um, it can seem a little confusing when it comes to timeline studies. And, you know, if you can find some kind of chart that you can have in front of you just to kind of refer to it. Um, it doesn't take away from your understanding of these things, but we'll talk about Ezra. We'll talk about Nehemiah. We'll talk about God's uh, restoration of his of his people the difficulties that they had in getting their act together, uh, but also remembering what the future is for these people, what true restoration is, what really coming home would be about. And that's, of course, to lead us to Jesus Christ. And that's what we always want to point out in these studies. And so through the rest of the Old Testament, we're going to look at a lot of the you know, intermixing of, of time periods, you know, going back to Jeremiah's day, going back to Daniel. Uh, in the, you know, the beginnings of, of, of the bondage and see some of those events. So in your typical Bibles, they're not necessarily laid out chronologically um, and just unfold that story. Uh, so we'll, we'll, make, we'll be mindful of that as we're discussing some of these things. Uh, so thinking about Ezra, what, what are some of your thoughts, Nick? Where do you want to start? Well, Ezra and Nehemiah are interesting companion books. Um, so we're, we're talking about the post-exile. Uh, these, is, these events take place after Babylonian captivity is over. Uh, if we can just allude to Daniel chapter 5, uh, we, we see the fall of Babylon there and the rise of Persia. And Cyrus is going to be the first emperor of Persia, and he gives out this decree that allows the Jews to go back into the land of Canaan to rebuild the temple uh, and to reestablish the city of Jerusalem. And, and so the first governor that's going to go back is going to be Zerubbabel, and the high priest is going to be Joshua. Uh, Ezra is going to be talking and focusing more on that, uh, that time period with Zerubbabel and Joshua. And, and then, of course, after Joshua and Zerubbabel's, their time period is over, then you're going to have the, the next governor that we talk about is going to be uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah is going to come over, and he's going to be a governor, and his priest is Ezra. So Ezra's book that he writes, that's named after him, is recounting the history prior to his time as the high priest. And then Nehemiah is going to be the one that chronicles the time when when Ezra's the priest and Nehemiah is the governor. And so uh, that can be a little confusing for some folks, but just remember uh, Zerubbabel, Joshua is the first set of uh, governor, high priest, uh, and then Nehemiah and Ezra would be the second. And, and so it's, it's really fascinating history to see how it all goes. And, and of course, uh, Haggai and Zechariah are going to be key uh, key prophets to read alongside of Ezra, and the key prophet to read alongside Nehemiah would be Malachi. Uh, and so you just kind of tuck that in the back of your mind uh, if you want to deepen your study a little bit. But, but Ezra, he, he's going to be talking about this uh, return back to, uh, back to uh, the Palestine area uh, for the Jews and the right. start of the rebuilding of the temple, but then there's going to be some trouble. Uh, with uh, with neighboring people and, and they're going to harass them and the rebuilding is going to be halted until the second year of Darius. When Darius is ruling uh, over Persia, 
uh, the prophets Zechariah and Haggai come and and move the people to begin rebuilding uh, the the temple. And in the sixth year, of Darius, uh, then the temple is going to be completed. And, yeah. and so that's really the the main emphasis that we want to see there in in Ezra is the rebuilding of the temple and the restoration of of that worship. Uh, and so it's. It's pretty fascinating, especially if you want to tie in Haggai and Zechariah uh, with with the events of Ezra. Okay. Yeah, and those are the you know the two key events or points to be made throughout Ezra is, of course, as you mentioned, the restoration of worship. Um, you know, and, and yes, it, it took them a long time. It wasn't that the building of the temple took a long time in and of itself, but it was just the constant delays. And, and the fact that they were letting the, the people that had, you know, kind of moved into the area want to take and, and to be a part of that building. You know, they, they would look up on the hill and they see God's people starting to rebuild a temple. And, you know, the political uh, folks of that, that time period, uh, you know, wanted to be a part of that. It's almost like, well, <laughs> I live in a town here where um, they're building a convention center and, you um, they're, they've they haven't finished the center it won't be ready for another year but yet it already has the name of one of the biggest supporters of the center and it's a local bank uh, in town and i have to say i went by the other day and i looked at that name and i said you know what with as many taxes and you know monies and all that other kind of stuff i know they're putting a, in a big amount but i kind of like to see my name up there <laughs> <laughs> and that just went through my mind you know thinking about how it was emblazoned already on an empty building and um, how the person with the, the biggest pockets and the status in the community gets that attention. And then I think about the temple. And that's exactly what some of the people that had become accustomed to living in this area and, uh, you know, being a part of, you know, the Jews who were there and uh, why, you know, for a name for themselves. Some of them, you know, made the, made the proclamation, well, we serve God too. You know, we're, we're out here worshiping him. And, um, you know, why can't we be part of this temple? And uh, the prophets will come along and say, no, nope, you're not a part of it, you know, <laughs> move along. And so it, it caused a lot of political division. Um, you know, it, it, it caused anger to, you know, write back to the king and say, who are these people showing up, you know, building? And the city was still pretty much in shambles. You know, you walk down the street. So we're going to see this probably more so in Nehemiah's day, but, or in Nehemiah's writings, but um, just how things weren't getting done. Because you find the commendation of the people when they got things done, it always says they had a mind to work. They brought their, their offerings before God. They got the work done for his purpose, for his glory. But when they didn't have a mind to work, nothing got done. I mean, even their worship fell apart. You know, they're defiling the temple, uh, trying to restore the, the Levitical priesthood. You know, it was like herding cats. Getting it together should have been something that when God told them to go into to, to exile, go willingly, go freely, make your homes there, live for a generation, and, and, you know, be ready to come back. It took the children of Israel 40 years when God initially caused them to wander in the wilderness because of their lack of faith. Um, 40 years, a generation passed. And a new generation rose to come in and come home and take this land that was overridden by pagans everywhere they looked, every corner of the land. And uh, they accomplished a lot of that. Yes, there were failings along the way, and that's another lesson. But what you find for the most part is they had a greater challenge then than they do now. Now they have the support of a, of a, of a pagan king. Uh, now they have you know, a purpose of exactly what they're going to do. Now they have the backing of what their own history was and how they can live up to that. They know they're God. They know what they can do and they're getting lazy with it. And, and, and that's a problem for us today. If we don't learn from those mistakes, we're not having to come in and restore worship. We're not having to come in and restore the church. Uh, we're not having to, to find our way again. We're here. The church exists. The kingdom of God is established and it is strong. But I have to look at my faith as an individual and say, am I willing to work? We have so many in the religious community today say, 
You know, works won't save you. You don't need to work. You don't need to do this. Yet everything about these prophets was about the people having a mind to do God's work. But they're wanting to play around. They're wanting to build homes for themselves and not provide for God. They're wanting to intermarry with the pagan nations around them and not provide for God. Everything that they were doing was in direct opposition to what God wanted his people to do and to be. And, and honestly, it's some of it's really discouraging. But it also reminds us of what we need not do, what, how we need to change our ways. What are some of your more of your thoughts, Nick? Well, yeah, if we take that as a whole, uh, you know, just, if you look at Malachi as a companion to Nehemiah, I mean, he hits those things side by side by side. Uh, you know, you, 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 you rob me, he says. Well, how do we rob you? Well, you're, you're not paying your, your tithes and offerings. Uh, you, you cause, uh, you know, tears to fall before my altar. Well, how do we do that? Well, you have forsaken the wife of your youth. I mean, yeah, you're, you're, uh, you're right when you're describing the Levitical priesthood as just being just uh, in chaos, uh, because it was. Uh, and so uh, as we see these, these two companion books working together, uh, I, I really appreciate to see how, um, you know, there's this restoration, there's this growth, and you can see these, uh, these strong men standing up saying, hey, we want to do things, and we're going to do things the right way. You see Zerubbabel, uh, he, he really gets convicted, and he, he says, yeah, we're going to rebuild this temple. And, and uh, sure, he had to be motivated a little bit from Haggai and Zechariah, but man, once he got on fire, he did it. And, and you see Joshua being, uh, you know, being the high priest with, with the illusions coming out of Zechariah chapter 3 and chapter 6. You see that Joshua becomes a, a, a vibrant uh, representative of the high priesthood. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his, his garments were soiled and, and unclean. And, and God says, oh, let's put, a new, let's put some new robes on. You know, you purify. Mm -hmm. and, and then he becomes this, uh, this uh, type and anti-type of the Christ, where Christ is going to restore the kingship and the priesthood into one man. There in chapter 6. I mean, it's just beautiful. You see Ezra uh, in, in chapter uh, in chapter 8 of, of Nehemiah that brings out the law. They're reading the law before the people. The people stand up and they're hearing the law. They're respecting it. The people say, amen, amen. I mean, this is exciting times. And, and the Levites are, are taking leadership and teaching the people what it is that they're hearing. I mean, it's just, it's just a beautiful picture to see that in spite of all the things that they have to really start working through, but you've got Nehemiah that's, that's pushing them, saying, no, you're going to change. you got Malachi being that prophet, that spokesman for God, Haggai, Zechariah, the same thing. And you got these leaders really trying to uh, bring this restoration because why did they go into captivity to begin with? It was because of their unwillingness to surrender to the intents and commands of God. And, and so they went into captivity they were in captivity for 70 years, this, this jubilee, and they're re returned and restored, and there's some growing pains, but they grow, and what's, what's interesting is that uh, it doesn't seem that idolatry is going to be an issue with the Jews uh, like it was before the captivity. That is something that they did overcome and that they were able to, to correct. And, and uh, they're going to have some other issues you want to work through. Once you get into the New Testament, you see that. But, you know, that, that idolatry, it's gone. You know, they, they have, right. have really realized, hey, we need to put our focus on God. And I, and I appreciate that. I, I, I appreciate seeing that in their attitude. No, you're absolutely right, because you get into the New Testament era and you, you find the, well, the attitude of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, you know, the, the, the arrogance, really. And you start to see signs of that here, even in the midst of them not getting their act together. As I said earlier, they still have this sense of, of pride when it comes to their service to God. And, and, you know, even it was, you know, the elders of the city, you know, are like, look, these, these intermarriage among these pagans is a problem. You know, they still had their, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, they still had their standard, you might say, mm -hmm. that they're living by. 
And, uh, you know, they, they went out on a limb to say, you know, this is something that God either approves or doesn't approve. I mean, it, it, it really reminds me of, of today. Uh, mm-hmm. I've talked with many people, especially lately here, who, who seem to be religious in their thinking and their understanding that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and, and our Savior. But yet they live very immoral lives. Um, a lot of bad language, you know, the, the, the use of alcohol. I mean, uh, sexual immorality. These things are still rampant in our world today, even among people that call themselves Christians or religious. And what you see, and you brought up Malachi earlier, you just see an exact pattern of the same mentality of people. And they get satisfied with what's going on in their lives at that time. And, and you see that even, how long has it been since we've seen changes, say, in the church today, in local congregations? Uh, you know, where the thinking changes, the attitude changes, sometimes the way we worship changes. Uh, are these things right? Are they wrong? Are we, are we just relying upon the traditionalism of, of the past? You know, my past doesn't go back more than 50-something years. Uh, but I've seen changes in people. Uh, and, you know, there were things that we've always done traditionally that we start looking at the Bible saying, well, is this really biblical? Is it really what God wants us to do? Uh, and people get caught up in tradition and, and how they do things. But anyway, I, I know I'm getting into an area that's more on my mind than really addresses the, the issues here, but you see the signs of this among the people and their attitude. Well, we're running out of time for our program today. And I hope that next week we can get more into a discussion about some of that because we're still going to see it in Nehemiah's day. We've already hinted on on some of the future, not not future, it's within the same time period, but uh, among what these men are dealing with. When you've got the restoration of the temple, you've got the wall of the city, uh, and of course, most importantly, the restoration of worship, the restoration of, of the law, and really getting down to the nitty gritty and restoring uh, the Levitical priesthood. I mean, down to the names, who are we involved with? You know, Ezra, you know, begins with the list of names and, and there were important specific things that God wanted then. And there are important specific things that God wants today. And we can still see a pattern in our worship today based upon the attitude and the respect toward God's revealed word that we find in the old Testament. That's why these studies are so important. So read your old testaments. And one, be glad that we don't have to do it exactly like they did it today. Jesus has made it a lot easier, but it doesn't take the responsibility off of us to do it with any less zeal or enthusiasm uh, toward his word. And I think that's one of the important lessons that we need to learn from looking at some of these stories of the past. Any last thoughts before we wrap up our show this morning? No, just uh, appreciate being able to get back on with you, Chris, and to start looking through these um, these books of the Bible again. And so looking forward to Nehemiah next week. So we're excited to come to you and uh, talk to you more about these things. Like I've said before in our programs, we're doing it real casual like, as you are, obviously know. You'll need to go and read these things. for yourself. And they're, they're short reads. A lot of the, uh, the prophets are very short and uh, 10 chapters. And uh, some of it might be confusing. So you might have questions. And uh, we'll search the scriptures together and we'll find those answers. Uh, because what we don't talk about today might be in your mind. And so uh, ask us, email us, Northside Church of Christ at hotmail.com. We'd love to sit down with you and have a Bible study on these things. And that's what really this program is all about. A 25 minute program on Saturday isn't going to answer all the questions that you would like to know. So ask us, and we'll spend the time together talking about God's word and answering those questions. So, that most importantly, um, you're not studying from a trivial point of view but you're studying to know what must I do in order to strengthen my relationship with God. And we'd love to help you do that. So please call on us, worship with us tomorrow, Northside Church of Christ in Russellville, Kentucky. If you're in the Morgantown area, north of Bowling Green, go see Nick at the uh, Christian Home Congregation. And we'd love to worship with you. Thank you for listening to Bible Talks Radio today. And I hope you have a good week and may God bless you in your search for his truth. Since I have been since I have been redeemed, I will glory in His name. Since I have been redeemed, since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name.